Hey, how are you? Welcome everyone to a very, very special session, interview, interaction, dialogue on World Heart Day. And that's about looking into a little deeper about, uh, regarding the South Asians, including the Indians having a greater incidence of heart disease and IBDs. And it's absolute pleasure to invite to dignitaries on stage who have been with the South Asian Heart Center and California, US. Uh, we have Dr. Cesar Molina, MD, FACC, co-founder and medical director. And we've got Mr. Ashish Mathur, MS, co-founder and executive director. So hearty welcome to both of us into this program. Um, I would love any one of you or both of you to share a little bit of the South Asian Heart Center before we dive deep into the causes and the remedies. So, over thank to you so much for inviting us and having us over. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, this meeting with you. The South Asian Heart Center arose as, uh, as a result of a need in our community. It started around 2016. And... Um, it happened because we were seeing a lot of very young South Asian engineers presenting to the emergency room at El Camino Hospital. El Camino Hospital is in the middle of Silicon Valley, it's in Mountain View, uh, the town where Google is uh, based, and it encompasses a district which includes also Apple Computer, uh, which is also within the treatment area of the hospital. So we started seeing a lot of uh, relatively young uh, men showing up with heart attacks. And we could not find that they, were, they did not have the typical risk factors that we had been taught in school as mm -hmm. to the reasons for, uh, for the heart attack. And then we delved deeply and that led to the creation of the South Asian Heart Center. First of all, congrats for this wonderful initiative which is born out of genuine concern for South Asians. Um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ashish Mathur, would you like to throw any light on this further? Yeah, I just wanted to say that we started actually in 2006. Uh, and so we've been there for a long time. And our focus has been to have a community-based program for the community, by the community, and with the community. Um, so we have... Um, you know, being blessed with the support of so many individuals who participate with us in this quest for reducing heart disease and diabetes within the community. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Tripathi, for having us uh, on World Heart Day today uh, with you. And we hope as we go forward that we work together to make a deep impact uh, in this issue. Yes, we as an organization, Freedom from Diabetes, are very much looking forward to this. And it's been nice to converse with you a couple of times prior to this video. So anyway, the audience is going to be looking for what's new that we have to offer or explain or help them understand. And one of the most remarkable things which I found as a part of your extensive research paper was this interesting ratio between non-HDL and apolipoprotein B being one of the most contributory cause for calcification in the coronary arteries. Of course, there are bigger, um, what do you say, BMR-related, uh, weight-related, age-related factors also which play a dominant role. It's not just this ratio, but it's, it's away from HSCRP or fasting insulin or total cholesterol versus HDL ratio. So Dr. Molina, would you love to should throw some more light on this? You would like to unmute yourself, sir. Um, thank you for asking. So the uh, the question is what is what are the drivers of coronary arteriosclerosis in the population in South Asians? So the way we went about asking that question and answering it was that coronary calcification is a non-invasive, very easy and relatively inexpensive uh, test to evaluate the presence of asymptomatic coronary arteriosclerosis, that is 
the presence of arteriosclerosis without any symptoms, which still increases your risk of heart attack. So we actually studied uh, the first 1,100 participants we joined our center. Now we have evaluated about 10,000. Wow. But looking at that first group, we actually noticed that the two epidemics uh, that are afflicting South Asia, that is the epidemic of diabetes and the epidemic of coronary artery disease, both of them are connected. They're connected by the fact that, and this is not news, age, but they're connected by the power, the importance of body mass index uh, and insulin resistance. Both of them are big drivers for both diabetes and coronary artery disease. And that's why body mass index was a very important predictor after age. But most interestingly, we did not find any of the lipid factors commonly associated with arteriosclerosis, meaning we saw no relationship with the LDL cholesterol, the cholesterol to HDL ratio, triglycerides, but we found a, a very strong relationship with the concentration of cholesterol in atherogenic particles. So this ratio that we came up to with the non-HDL cholesterol, which is all the cholesterol that does not contain HDL, meaning all the cholesterol that is considered to be atherogenic or causing arteriosclerosis, divided by the number of particles gives us a concentration per particle of cholesterol, of non-HDL non cholesterol or atherogenic cholesterol. So the interesting thing is that the lower the concentration, the smaller the particle, and the higher the incidence uh, and severity of coronary arteriosclerosis in the population at any age. Interesting, very interesting. I'm still trying to grasp, and I'm sure the audience will also trying to grasp for a while. So we all have heard HDL cholesterol as the good cholesterol, and we are saying non-HDL cholesterol. In a way, you're saying the non-good cholesterol in simple language, which is the atherogenic cholesterol. And That's correct that becomes the numerator and the denominator becomes apolipoprotein B. That and is correct. If that becomes less than 1.4 is what I read, that the calcification in the heart arteries will increase. Dr. Is, Munda, am I right? That is correct. You got it. So one thing which is confusing me is, let's say the good cholesterol, if it increases, then that is associated with a drop in the non-HDL cholesterol. The total cholesterol doesn't change, and therefore the numerator would change. The, the numerator would change, and the effect of that and the denominator would uh, would stay the same. And therefore, you're actually leading with uh, bigger particles, okay, and, uh, and a bigger ratio. So let's say because common numbers for Indians, let's say if you look at, and I, I guess. When you say South Asians, maybe you were handling 80% Indians or 90% Indians. In our, in our cohort, it's, made, it's over 90% uh, uh, individuals from, from India. And right. they, are mainly, uh, they are mainly actually uh, first arrivals. That is, they're not second or third generation. They there are individuals who moved from India uh, and started working in Silicon Valley. Yes. Uh, so they're native, native uh, uh, individuals from the Indian subcontinent. But when we may, when we talk about South Asians, we're not talking about Southeast Asians, which are the people from Vietnam and Cambodia. We're talking from individuals that trace their origins to the Indian subcontinent. So we're talking about Pakistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, all those, uh, all those countries that are connected. Uh, to the uh, Indian subcontinent. So largely the Indian peninsula and surrounding areas. So let's say on an average, let's say if you see Indians having a total cholesterol of let's say 200. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just taking a rough number. Yes. <clears throat> Those who are not on statins. And um, HDL we've seen because now we've got a great database of maybe more than 33,000 people that HDL might be on the lower side. Indians tend to have it on the lower side, let's say 35 right. or maybe 40 at the most. Very rarely you see 50 or 60 in Indians. Now, 
if let's say apolipoprotein B becomes a certain number, let's say it's 100. Okay, I'm just taking for the sake of discussion. Sure. And HDL is let's say 40. HDL is 40 out of 200. Then the non-HDL becomes 160. Mm -hmm. So 160 divided by 100 apolipoprotein B, the ratio becomes let's say 1.6. That is correct. And the person is in the safer side. Well, he is expected to have he is expected to have less coronary calcification than someone who has a ratio of 1.3. So if his HDL becomes 70, which is a rarity, but let's say even 60 for that matter. Yes. Then the non-HDL becomes, let's say, 140. It becomes on the lower side. The denominator remains the same, apolipoprotein B, 100. Yes. So now... No, that may not, that's probably not the case, you see, because you have replaced, you have replaced non-atherogenic, uh, uh, atherogenic cholesterol. So you actually, the thing is this, there is one molecule of, apopro of apoprotein B per molecule of non-HDL cholesterol. Okay. So you would expect if you are actually lowering the non-HDL cholesterol because you're lowering the total cholesterol and increasing the HDL cholesterol, you would also expect the number of particles to decrease. Right. So that is why you see there, there's that connection and, and there's a one-to-one -one relationship. And it, it can be, it can sort of be explained easily uh, uh, and better with a picture. Uh, and um, I can I can more or less uh, let me see if I can find you a quick picture on that. Um, this would be interesting for our medical doctors and our medically educated patients and participants because our participants take a lot of interest in understanding the medical side of um, you know what's happening inside their body. And um, whatever picture if, if you could share, it would be really nice. So so let's let, let me just do that very quickly now. Yes, please. and uh, and uh, let's see here what am I sharing here? Okay, yeah. so um, let me let me do it a little better job at sharing. Okay, um, sure. sure. <laughs> and as I you do, I, you my whole, I love my whole. Uh, so uh, here we are. Let me uh, see if I can share again. And here, what you can see, this is actually. These are the non-HDL contain. This is non-HDL cholesterol. That is everything that is non-HDL. That right. includes chylomicrons, DLDL cholesterol, chylomicron remnants, intermediate density lipoproteins, and LDL cholesterol and LP little a. They all contain one ApoB. Mm, nice. So that is actually how you know how it does show itself. Uh, and that is what we mean by non-HDL cholesterol. Super. And what so, we're doing is when we're dividing it by ApoB, we're ultimately getting the total, the, the, the concentration, the concentration of cholesterol per particle of hmm. non-HDL or atherogenic lipoproteins. So that answers by mathematical question, which was coming. So from 40 HDL, if the person went to 70 HDL, the numerator became 130, but so did the denominator. Correct. Go down by another 30 points. And the person has his ratio about 1.4 and safer. Thank you so much for that clarity. And I think those pictures were quite uh, revealing in terms of from the chylomicron to lipoprotein A, the inner covering, outer covering. Would you want to share anything on that also for the benefit of the audience? Well, actually, yeah, the, the, the best way to sort of look at it also uh, is let me just sort of um, show you here in a minute another another way of looking at it in a very in a very simplistic fashion. So, yeah. uh, and that's coming. <clears throat> in India, popularly, total cholesterol to HDL ratio is kind of looked at to remain 4 as to 1. So let's say if you have 50 
level of HDL, 200 total cholesterol is considered a good ratio for protecting the heart. So this yeah, is so what we found was that really in our in our study, we found that the levels of cholesterol per se, that is the level of total cholesterol, the level of HDL cholesterol, the level of LDL cholesterol, and even LP little a were not associated with the severity of coronary arteriosclerosis. Now, let me show you something Please. Uh, on this slide that is also, it goes to, again, explain what we're talking about. That mm -hmm. is, this is an individual with uh, uh, 100 milligrams of non-HDL um, non cholesterol. These are two individuals, same okay. non-HDL cholesterol. It could also be same LDL cholesterol. And the reason that, the, so what you can see here is that, and this is something that we routinely do not measure. That is, if you measure in this individual with 100 milligrams of non hdl cholesterol, there are seven molecules of ApoB. Okay. Here there's only one. So what's really happening is that there are actually seven particles that are very small mm -hmm. at 100 milligrams of non hdl cholesterol versus just one particle that is very big of non-HDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. This area here is mm -hmm. considered to be associated with more arteriosclerosis. And that is really what our study showed. Oh. Now, what we did is we actually came up with a very simple formula that can be done at the, in the clinic. You just need to have a non-HDL cholesterol that is a total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and an ApoB mm -hmm. level which is easily obtained in any clinic. Correct. And therefore, then you can come up with this ratio right. without, having to, you know, without having to do very fancy um, evaluations with uh, uh, MRI or NMR uh, mm. or run gels or done IO mobility studies, which are very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, here, we just sort of come up with a, a, quick, a quick, and it's just simple arithmetic. It's just a, a subtract, and a subtract, uh, you take, a subtraction, and you make a division, right. and you got the ratio. Correct. Very interesting. Is there, um, I mean, would you like to just share a little bit more on this? I know it's very technical for lay people, I mean, a certain percentage of them, but I'm sure there'll be enough takers to understand it better. But would you like to share a little bit more on under what circumstances would you have a bigger molecule of ApoB? Okay versus smaller molecules of ApoB. So this is actually a very, very good question. And this is how we, it connects back to the epidemic, dual epidemics in India. And that is in, in, in individuals of any ethnic origin, but particularly individuals of South Asian origin. Um, if you are predisposed to diabetes or you have metabolic syndrome, or you're, uh, you have, you'd have the tendency to have more non-HDL cholesterol because you have a low HDL level. You right. just mentioned that in, in South Asians, you see lower HDL. Correct. And at the same time, that's associated with larger numbers or higher ApoB, which has also been identified in South Asians. Now, that is commonly seen in people who are at risk for diabetes. Mm -hmm. And South Asians tend to have the some of the highest incidence of diabetes in the world. So there are these dual epidemics of diabetes and coronary artery disease, and they're connected. They're connected by the fact that they are hyperglycemic. They have these metabolic abnormalities that are associated with this metabolism, that mm -hmm. is elevated uh, elevations in triglycerides, low HDL, uh, elevations in a waste to high... Uh, waist to height ratio, abdominal yes. obesity, elevations in hemoglobin A1C, fasting blood sugar, associated with that, they have a lot of small particles of cholesterol. Mm. When you go and measure the cholesterol itself, you don't see the relationship. You just have to sort of really get an idea of the, the percentage, the size of the particles and the number of the particles. So how, that's it's how it's really related. So for any individual, they want to see what is my risk. Okay. Then the question is, am I at risk for diabetes? Is my fasting blood sugar over 100? 
do I actually have a, a high triglyceride greater than 150, 200, 300? Um, and then that can give you an idea if you're on that path of leading to diabetes, which also leads to coronary artery disease. And we show this very, very uh, directly, but many, many other publications have demonstrated that relationship between insulin resistance and metabolic abnormalities with the incidence of heart attack and coronary artery disease in this population. Right. In fact, um, most individuals, most South Asians who present to the hospital with a heart attack will have hyperglycemia. And many of them will have normal, cholest normal LDL cholesterol. In fact, we found that in this country, when we compared our South Asian cohort with the uh, na national cohort, which is known as NHANES, South Asians actually have the same LDL cholesterol or lower than, than the typical non-South Asian American. So it's not, a, it's not at the level of just superficial cholesterol levels. We okay. have to go just a little deeper. Yes. And that was very exciting for me to understand. And we felt that we should spread this knowledge to a larger number of people over here. It's been very, very uh, insightful till now, Dr. Molina. And, you know, I want to come back to that question a little bit more. So what you're saying is if the person is hyperglycemic, for example, he or she is going to have more smaller particles of apolipoprotein B. That is, is correct. Problem? That oh. is your right. Okay, great. And so goes with central obesity. Correct? That's correct. Okay, what other factors will reduce the size of the lipoprotein B? Hyperglycemia, central obesity, what else? Abdominal, uh, uh, an abdominal waste. That's what is defined by, by abdominal obesity. So, the abdominal. elevation of, high, you know, if the presence of high blood pressure I is know. associated. Now, how is it associated? Well, there are multiple levels because high insulin levels are associated with increased salt and water retention, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, um, in the press, if you already have arteriosclerosis, if you already have coronary calcification, you have lost some of this, the flexibility and the elasticity of your arteries. And therefore, it is much more uh, common to identify high blood pressure, which depends on the resistance. So if you lose, if you increase vascular resistance by losing elasticity uh, in the arterial circulation, then you also expect to have an elevation in the blood pressure. Yeah. Great. So let's connect this to the day-to-day -day life of a South Asian. Okay. What role do you see of, let's say, a South Asian diet or Let's say stress could be, again, it could be South Asian, non-South Asian, everyone could be going through stress. But let's say if you look at the dietary part, we tend to consume ghee and milk products and, you know, um, a lot of grains, which I've seen I, I, as a matter of just testing. I purposefully had more grains in a particular meal. I had four fulkas or chapatis or, you know, flatbreads, Indian flatbreads as an experiment. Not very big, just 30 grams. I had four of them, okay, and uh, it'll be also, and I checked my triglycerides immediately half, after half an hour, which is not usually done, but as an experiment, I did it, and it was like 509, 509, and I went through the 12-hour fasting, and then the triglycerides were okay, they were 164. So the thing is this, you see, this syndrome of small, the presence of small particles um, uh, is also associated. There are many factors, many abnormalities associated with it. It's just not one thing. It's, it's, a, it's a conglomeration of abnormalities. And one of those abnormalities is prolonged, prolonged postpandrial hypertriglyceridemia. Oh. So even 12 hours later, you're looking at a 169. So the, going back to South Asian culture and the, the in the culture, the vegetarian lifestyle is important. This uh, lifestyle of non-aggression. Now, 
the important thing here is that it has to be a vegetable containing vegetarian diet. And it's so common to have a grain base and not a vegetable containing vegetarian diet. And, and you know, this is actually not only grain based, but you know, you can have a soda and a French fries and you have just finished eating a vegetarian diet, which is not vegetable containing. I mean, if you consider a, a, an apple, if you consider a, pot a potato a vegetable, then there you go. But it really is not what we're talking about. Now, high vegetable containing diet is a high fiber diet. And that high fiber diet is associated with a lower risk of diabetes of up to 60%. Having, having complete grains versus processed grains is associated with a 30% reduction in heart attacks, stroke, and diabetes, at least in American physicians who were studied. So the more fiber you have in the diet, the lower the risk of diabetes, and then that can follow through as the lower the risk of coronary artery disease in South Asians. So now, it's just shifting the diet from... from uh, chapatis or white bre or, or bread and changing the, uh, switching the diet to, from rice base to more fiber containing products. And that, you know, that can be done easily. You just have to have more yeah, vegetables. More salads and, and more cooked vegetables. And that's a big message which we've been promoting that try and make it 25% each. If you're having one flat bread, have one cup of cooked lentils have one full cup of cooked vegetables and one full cup, one and a half cup of salads. And if you want to have one more grain portion, then repeat with lentils, cooked vegetables and salads. Make your meal 25% each because the typical Indian or South Asian meals we find are, though they might be feeling, oh, I'm vegetarian, I'm protected, but they're not because the grain content is high it goes to 50 or 60%. It'll be like three or four chapatis or flatbreads with very little dal or which is cooked lentils or some cooked vegetables, which is like very, very small and they might miss the salads. And that's not right. And what you say is so bang on that the rising triglyceride content, which is sustained and continuous after every meal, I mean, I, I did as an experiment, it was like a shocker for me that, oh my God, what is happening? Okay. And because of long COVID, I've realized, I, I've been going through long COVID, a new thing, you know, six and a half, 65 million people are going through that. So that's putting my exercise regime into a disease. So I can see the effect of that on my cholesterol levels. And it's very really interesting to keep experimenting and seeing what's happening in your own body. And then you see reports of participants and you learn so much more. What would be your take on ghee and milk products? So that's actually also a very interesting question. And that is, and actually, you know, eating with nice, nice organic, organically produced ghee is associated with a feeling of fullness and warmth in your gastrointestinal tract after a nice meal. Now, ghee is mainly is butter and it's saturated fat. It's mainly saturated fat. Um, but you see, the problem is not eating the saturated fat as, as it is, because if anything, ghee will increase your HDL cholesterol. Consumption of ghee will lower your triglycerides long term. So it's really, it's not the ghee, it's the simple processed carbohydrates. And the ghee should be used in small amounts. Now, we also know that if you have, and this is actually not, not a, pertaining to India because India is not a major olive oil producer. There are other oils. But if you replace if you replace ghee with the safflower oil or the canola oils or the palm kernel oils that are common in India, you will actually see a drop in HDL cholesterol. And you have a rise in triglycerides. So if you actually, but that's in comparison to having a diet that is exclusively using olive oil. The exclusive use of olive oil and having two tablespoons of olive oil in the diet per day, according to the Perimet trial that was done in Spain, decreases the risk of diabetes by about 40%. So you're using oil 
to decrease the risk of diabetes. Um, in this case, the suggestion- Two teaspoons. Two tablespoons, extra. Two tablespoons, so six yeah. teaspoons, okay. Yeah, so, but in, in this case, anyhow, my, the concern is really, the concern is really that you don't want to deep fry in ghee. Right. You just want to sort of prevent, you know, extract the flavors of the spices in the ghee and use the, the ghee that way. There's no need to dump a lot of ghee on white rice. There's ah. really no need to dump, you know, a, a, a bunch of ghee on a chapati. That's not the purpose of it. Oh. Uh, the chapati tastes really good by itself with all the other, you know, spices in the curries and stuff. So you just have to minimize in that respect is consumption, but I would not, you know, it's not, it's not really from, from our point of view, that is not the, re, that's not the driver of arteriosclerosis and diabetes in South Asians. Now, total calories and obesity is, if you have excessive calories, you then have excessive risk of obesity, and then that's a big driver. Hmm, that's great. Do you love, a little side note, do you love Indian food? Dr. Molina? I'm actually, I'm a, I, I love it. I enjoy it very much. <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, there have been periods of time where I've gone to this restaurant and have a, this big, you know, Italian, big, huge mound of rice with a <laughs> you know, big fry. Uh, and it's, it's actually not, it's, it's, it's very addictive. It's very, very addictive, very good. <laughs> but there has to be a better way. So yes. uh, you bring a very good point, and that is, it is important to be a good cook, to have a good, healthy diet. So we're not talking about eating like a rabbit. We are, yes. we are actually talking about eating like a gourmet. And you have to be, you need to pay attention to the preparation of your food. And, and actually that food will then only, not only may bring happiness and contentment, but actually that nourishment will keep you healthy. Absolutely, absolutely. And we've got some... Amazing cook in every family across India. They, of course, that generation is a little older one. Younger generation also picking up. The youngest generation, we don't know what's going to happen <laughs> later in terms of cooking. But there are amazing cuisines and different recipes which are traditional, age-old, very healthy, very tasty, uh, which are getting lost at times. And we would love to bring that to the audience at some other time. Anyway, I think we've had a nice hearty chat. I thought we would be speaking for 20 minutes or so. We've gone really beyond, but I think it's in the interest of all those who are uh, wanting to learn more. So we could move towards the closure part. And what I would just um, love to hear and everyone would love to hear is in a way, what precautions South Asians can take, what kind of a diet, exercise, stress regime, and effect of stress besides food and exercise would you just like to share as pointers so actually um I, I i want to actually also um, bring up a point and that is our resources at the south asian heart center um have, are available worldwide that is anyone who has access to the internet can actually have access to the services and the information and knowledge that is available at the south asian heart center so this is something that is not just available to the residents of Silicon Valley in California is available worldwide and it's available to your listeners. They just have to go to southasianheartcenter.org and they will have access not only to uh, possibly participating in our programs, but also we have multiple fantastic well, uh, um, a well uh, edited uh, lectures on how to eat how about the importance of exercise, stress, sleep, uh, all those factors that are associated with good living and long living. So that's available, but we have developed at the South Asian Heart Center a very simple curriculum. And a curriculum that if I were to write a book would all fit in an index card. Oh, wow. And in that index card, it actually, uh, we, we call this MEDS. And M stands for meditation. And in this case, very, very simple, very natural meditation. We have, we have incorporated transcendental meditation into our program because it's available worldwide. And actually there's a lot of science behind it. The E stands for exercise. And for exercise, it's about 
21 miles of walking per week, which is only three miles per day, which is only 6,000 steps per day. It's not the 10,000. Um, we also recommend vigorous and, you know, vigorous and all kinds of activity are of great benefit. The D is in reference to nutrition. And the nutritional recommendation is to eat a, a diet that is as a plant-based diet of freshly prepared, fresh food. So nice. something that comes in a bag is not freshly prepared, fresh food, like chips. So, and that is, that's nutrition. And that includes two fists, two fists of cooked vegetables per day, of real vegetables, one fist of fruit, 12 nuts daily, any nut. We recommend non-salted, but there you go. And uh, we ask for the avoidance of sugary uh, 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 liquids or juices, you know, juices, soda, all the colas and stuff like that. That's just a simple diet. And then lastly, sleep. And we are actually living in such a dynamic world that we need to pay attention to having some rest. And we rec there's beautiful data and science showing that the sweet spot for sleep is seven to eight hours. You sleep less than six hours, you have more hypertension, heart disease. You sleep more than nine hours or more, you have more cancer. Um, and diabetes. So that's the very simple, very, very simple curriculum or of life. It's just how to incorporate that into your regular routine. Silent through meditation in this very dynamic world and stress reduction, a good diet made of freshly prepared fresh food where you can see that that is what it is. It's non-processed food. And then just... Uh, be able to sort of go home, you know, lie down, close the eyes and sleep. So nice and so beautifully, succinctly captured. I invite everyone who's watching this session to visit South Asian Heart Center. They're based out of the Silicon Valley, California, and they've got a wonderful curriculum, wonderful information, nice videos, which you will benefit from. Thank you so much, Dr. Molina. Thank you so much, Mr. Ashish Matur, for making this happen. Um, anything as a quick message towards the end in terms of inspiration or motivation is welcome. Well, Dr. Tripathi, I mean, I, um, uh, I'm here to kind of also be inspired by the work that you do day in and day out in terms of uh, spreading the knowledge. And number two, and more importantly, getting people involved. Um, you know, I, I often see people who absorb the knowledge because, you know, it's out there and today you can go to the internet and find everything. But I do truly believe in the power of the touch, in the power of uh, working with people and having that community. And, uh, you know, that is this underlying thing that as we are going forward, we are kind of missing as well. And so, the work that you do in the community in terms of educating and getting people to do something about this issue is what we are after as well. And so um, thank you for, for bringing this message to everybody. Thank you so much. Any, any final know, words, actually, Dr. Yeah, Molina? So the thing is we cannot forget this too. Uh, in the little curriculum that I just mentioned is it's also important to hang around, to be with nice, good people. And uh, you know, it's you know, there's a, there's a great health promotion to to joy, and uh, and that's that's actually uh, you know highly recommended. But to be able to experience it, you need to have a well functioning physiology. Right. And you have to pay attention to yourself, yeah. and that's just. Sometimes, you know, I have, I have been in practice for over 30 years and I have been an interventional cardiologist. So I have taken care of a lot of people with heart attacks they, while they have had their worst day of their lives. And 20 years later, they come and ask me, doctor, why am I still here? Why are my grass still open? Why am I not, you know, why haven't I had, you know, multiple angioplasties and stents? And I have had to come up with an answer. And the, the best answer that I have been able to come up with is that 
that individual has paid a little bit of attention to himself or herself. And that little attention to yourself goes a very, very long way. Wow, that's so nice. I've always been thrilled by this um, you know, journey of bringing the heart back into medicine, hardcore medicine. And that took me on to this whole path of freedom from diabetes and uh, connecting people through mentoring, through clubs, which are there now in almost 25 countries and seeing almost 15,000 diabetics free and uh, continuing to bring more joy in their life, more attention to themselves is something which is experienced and happening through this wonderful team. And seeing that all getting reinforced from your words is very, very heartening. So thank you very much for bringing the insights, both absolute ratios about knowledge deal to A polypropylene B to the heart, to the joy, to the attention that we bring to ourselves being so critical. So thank you so much. And we'll definitely be in touch and take things further from here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Best.